Mm-hmm. Okay, so I think I would start. There might be, oh, it's coming. Um, so I would start. Uh, my name is Isabella Main, and I'm associate professor in uh, in the Institute of Anthropology and Ethnology at Adam Mickiewicz University. Uh, I would like also to uh, mention that I am associated with the Center for Migration Studies, uh, which is organizing a series of uh, webinars. I would like to to welcome you all. I would like also to introduce and welcome Professor Buchowski, who is the director of the Center for Migration Studies. And I'm very pleased to present uh, Nergis Chanepe, the first speaker in 2021. So it's uh, our first uh, webinar this year. Uh, and maybe I will start with a, with a short story how Professor uh, Chanepe present is possible. Uh, we actually met in 2016 when, uh, with the Institute of Anthropology and with the Faculty of Legal Studies at Adam Mickiewicz University. Uh, uh, the ISFM uh, conference was organized in Poznań entitled Redefining Forced Migration, and uh, and Nergis was here. So I'm really pleased to 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 have the chance to meet her pre- previously. And of course, today it's not possible to meet in person, but uh, we are meeting uh, online. Uh, Professor uh, Nergis uh, Chanefe is a Turkish-Canadian scholar, and she's specializing in uh, many disciplines in public international law, in international politics, forced migration studies, and also human rights, critical human rights. And she has been teaching uh, in several European and Turkish universities, and is a faculty member uh, at York University in Canada since 2003. She has published uh, really many scholarly articles and several books, and I will just mention a few. You can find many more titles. So the recent one, Transitional Justice and Forced Migration, 2019, The Syrian Exodus, 2018, The Jewish Diaspora as a Paradigm, 2014, uh, when the book published in uh, Turkish, Nationalist Identity and Belonging, uh, another one, Turkey and European Integration, uh, Most Recent Limits of Universal ju- uh, Jurisdiction, a Critical Debate on Crimes Against Humanity, and she's uh, there are two more books in press. So all this is, I think, uh, very interesting and very impressive. Uh, and uh, and finally, I would like to mention, which uh, leads me to the high hopes that uh, you can come at some point in person again to Poznań. Uh, you are invited. And because she's also a trained artist, and she's designing uh, murals and making them. So that would be really great also to, to have the chance to experience this aspect of your activity. Um, the lecture will be more or less uh, 40 minutes, uh, 40, 50 minutes, and then there is uh, time for questions and answers. Um, well, it's in English. If you think it's uh, necessary or needed that I try to translate the question uh, please uh, let me know and we can also you can also ask questions in Polish. I would like also to ask everybody to turn off the microphone uh, so we have a better uh, quality of the of the webinar. So the floor or the screen is yours. Welcome welcome again. Please start. Thank you very much. <clears throat> I think this is one of the uh, unexpected side effects, pleasurable side effects of the, the coronavirus that we can actually meet um, with relative ease um, despite the conditions that are introduced by the pandemic. So I'd like to um, thank Isabella and Elsbieta, who is here, uh, as well as uh, Professor Bukowski um, and Marta for organizing this, making it possible and uh, also all the atten- attendees, <clears throat> the people who are attending. And um, I'm hoping that this will lead to a larger discussion. And I'm very, very hopeful that uh, sometime in the fall, I can actually physically be there. And I won't be just a talking head in a, in a rectangle. <laughs> so, uh, which, which seems to be um, these days my self-image, 
when I close my, my eyes, that's how I see myself. Uh, <clears throat> so today's topic is something I've been working on for the last two, three years. And um, uh, we actually organized a workshop on the same topic in Delhi. Um, and there'll be another international work, or, or workshop I'm hoping to organize, albeit online, uh, at Osgood Hall Law School uh, in 2021, if all, all goes well. And um, the reason why I'm mentioning these activities is that I feel I, I need the joining of minds and, and, and many different experiences and ideas so that one can develop a wholesome uh, framework in terms of looking at uh, social, legal and historical dimensions of statelessness from a global lens. And therefore, your questions are most welcome. If you do have first time experience of working with stateless groups and peoples, um, if you have legal experience, <clears throat> I'm more than happy to receive any comments that you have. I'm always a student and I hope to remain as a student. And this subject is no exception to that. So in terms of uh, statelessness, um, the status and rights of non-citizens, um, th this is how I'd like to approach the subject. It represents a very special conundrum for both advocates and um, scholarly disciplines ranging from political science to sociology to social legal studies to law to anthropology to social work, the whole spectrum basically because it constitutes a very specific category of vulnerability um, that escapes address uh, both within the domestic national context and also internationally. A substantial and growing body of literature addresses <clears throat> the position of non-citizens uh, in a multitude of countries and there's emphasis on obligations to protect stateless people under international law and refugee and forced migration studies is opening up doors in terms of developing further debate and yet scholars policymakers advocates <clears throat> uh, the ngos and ingos um, first line frontline responders on the ground um, until now, and then I think into the future, especially with the pandemic conditions, have been at a loss concerning what to do with the non-citizenship position par excellence, how to deal with stateless people. And in my presentation or the discussion, I'm going to look at uh, several different scenarios of statelessness. And I hope that you would agree with me that one particular definition does not fit all circumstances and in terms of theoretical approaches we have to be flexible and um, we have to develop an understanding which is multifaceted and layered. So it is true that stateless persons belong to a certain legal category protected under international law which is the convention related to status of stateless persons as well as there's a convention on the reduction of statelessness it is also true that <clears throat> since 2014, the UNHCR launched an I Belong campaign and global action plan to end statelessness. And I was there when it was actually launched. And I remember looking at the documents being part of the debates in different venues. And when these campaigns are launched, there are often a few success stories where there are individual negotiations with states but they kind of disappear in the horizon as time goes by, partially because the problem is not a st static problem. What I mean is, um, let's say you have half a million stateless people right now within the European context. Even if you give uh, citizenship and nationality status to um, 200,000, in the next 10 years, the number goes up again to half a million or more because the, the mechanisms that feed into statelessness globally continue to operate. So it's an ongoing issue and therefore there cannot be one action plan that can bring, bring the phenomena to end uh, gradually. It's not a static phenomenon. Uh, so this is a very, very significant gap in our understanding and in, in our formulation of statelessness. So <clears throat> if we were to critically examine the question of the relationship between forced migration and statelessness, then we really need to pay attention to certain intersections between um, global postcolonial, <clears throat> um, sometimes um, neoliberal politics of citizenship, labor regimes, 
um, socioeconomic transformations in regions which constitute as either hubs for migration or hubs for warfare. And overall, the, the, the components in legal regimes of accountability, um, which basically provide uh, a, a certain breadth of comfort to states in terms of denying citizenship and then no one else uh, is then able to come into the picture and then do something about it. So the typical example, of course, is the Rohingya population and Burma, Myanmar, but there are many others, uh, including from the Middle East region, um, unorthodox minorities um, in the MENA region, as well as Kurds. And there are also multitude of examples in South America and to a degree in Europe as well. And there are some examples <clears throat> Um, in the in the Eastern European context, so so it's actually an intersectional phenomenon, and you might say, well, that applies to every event in forced migration. Uh, yes, but in this case, um, it also makes it very difficult in terms of producing solutions because it creates uh, an environment of impunity. So the very nation state that denies this, this, the citizenship status of <clears throat> a certain groups cannot be uh, rendered accountable for their acts because it could be a parliamentarian legislative decision. And then at the international fora, other than these groups being included in the waves of forced migration and some ad hoc solution being produced, there is no such direct address as to what is to be done with these people. So what looks like a good idea on paper in terms of ending statelessness in practice basically creates um, a, a very long situation of limbo and dispersion of these populations. Um, one typical example is the Tibetan diaspora. Another one is the Tamil diaspora. So <clears throat> if we were to analyze the specific ways in which excesses of power are produced and reproduced, um, that lead to not global migration flows, but also a very specific form of that migration, forced migration, which is migration related to statelessness. Um, this kind of movement has particular consequences for uh, human rights abuses, um, social justice concerns, as well as labor arrangements. So this is something I am going to look at more closely within the next two years because I'm looking at uh, populations that are rendered stateless within the Middle Eastern context and what happens to these people. Who then employs them as workers? They are not in camps. Uh, the majority of them are urban refugees or some of them actually move from um, country to country. So there is like a, um, <clears throat> a route um, that links Lebanon, Libya, Egypt, Turkey, uh, Iraq, and Syria. Um, and by the way, the, the conclusion of my monograph on the Syrian exodus um, indicated that statelessness is going to be a label that will end up being applied to the majority of asylum seekers and, and uh, refugees and, and migrants um, escaping Syria. And when I said it first, um, when I actually tried to share it with a, with a, with a number of colleagues from the Middle East um, and elsewhere, um, they weren't so sure. I mean, that was um, about, what, uh, three, four years ago. But now I think people are beginning to <clears throat> agree more and more that seven or eight million Syrians, by all accounts, are de facto stateless, if not de jure, because they cannot prove their identity. There is no right of return for them. And, and therefore, um, for all intensive purposes, they have to be treated as stateless people, especially in terms of echoing of new nationality. So, <clears throat> I mean, in this later neoliberal postcolonial age of migration, um, th there is often the concern that the major flows are from the global south to the global north. But we do know from the European context, for instance, that there is a, a, a very regular flow of migration and also forced migration within the north, as well as between the, 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 the south south. So there are mixed and mixed population flows that are massive in size um, uh, among the countries in the global south. And my approach to that is 
really and truly we have to treat them not as countries but as hubs um, whereby we can pay attention to particular sectors where there is a need for fresh labor and or for political gains there could be mass appropriation of populations so forced migration and especially statelessness also have a very deep political meaning um, in the global south but i suspect in the global north as well so the transborder flows among countries and constituencies in the global south and migratory mo movements uh, as far as statelessness is concerned as we do know start with internal internal displacement so the story <clears throat> that is interesting for those of us who work on statelessness is one doesn't become stateless all of a sudden um, and, and, and then ends up crossing the border in mass although there are instances of that um, such as what happened with partitions in southeast asia uh, but even those took time they took a decade so the beginning of that journey um, of being stateless and having no citizenship and, and therefore nobody being accountable uh, as to how they treat you starts from the point of being internally displaced. Um, and that usually starts with the sp stripping of certain kinds of rights. Um, and within the internally displaced geographies, if the movement becomes a transborder flow, that's the very moment when the category of statelessness actually crystallizes and it becomes visible. So you could be stateless within the domestic unit, the nation state, but it becomes more or less uh, treated as an internal problem. Uh, of course, there'll be violence and there'll be discrimination, there'll be human rights abuses, but it will be um, <clears throat> countenanced as a part of um, the, the, the inner domestic politics of things. Um, but when you cross the border and, in, and you become a transborder phenomenon, so to speak. First of all, you see issues concerning border violence, and then the narratives become much more crystallized and audible as to what has happened to you while you were in there. And once you cross the border, then you also deal with population policies, migration management, which means NGOs and INGOs come into the picture. Uh, there's some degree of introduction of international politics because no doubt you become a burden for somebody. And I'm not saying it in a normative way, but the moment you cross the border, and especially if it's a large group of people, um, then it is necessarily a responsibility and a burden for the, <clears throat> the, the constituency that receives that population. And then there's the protracted nature of statelessness, just like protracted uh, nature of displacement in the sense that these kinds of problems, as we know from the Rohingya problem, for instance, cannot be resolved in one, uh, <clears throat> one sweep um, maneuver in the sense that you can't send everybody back into the, into the constituency where they were expelled from or um, they ran away. They usually remain in the border territory and or the movement continues um, almost subterranean into the region. And, and sometimes you then see, um, <clears throat> I mean, I love using migration maps and the arrows often lead you to, to the most unexpected places. So for instance, there's an entire migration hub uh, between um, <clears throat> Asia, Southeast Asia and the Gulf countries in terms of labor flows. And most of the people who are <clears throat> the laborers who are employed with Gulf countries um, end up being in a situation of statelessness and or rightlessness before they migrate to the Gulf, Gulf as workers, which renders them doubly vulnerable. So there is like emergent new regimes that actually feed from the situation of people who have no status. Um, and then they become ready-made labor force that is quite malleable, um, that is already vulnerable. And then they say yes to the um, <clears throat> most uh, egregious uh, working contracts, if you call them contracts. Um, you also have uh, issues concerning um, nationality laws uh, and labor laws um, as they apply or do not apply to stateless peoples. 
So any of the debates that are endemic to those of us who work in the forced migration area apply to stateless people's positions as well. So number one proposition that I put on the table, especially for our students' concerns, obviously my colleagues are very aware of these, is that forced migration is not an individual phenomenon, although it has immense individual consequences for people's lives um, and, um, <clears throat> and well-being. It is a group phenomena, it is a class phenomena, it's a social phenomena, and it has a very clear political pedigree. So it doesn't happen individually. In the least, it happens to households. But secondly, statelessness, because it does require a denial of a legal status, does not um, affect you, me, and then the next person. It affects categories of people. And almost uh, simultaneously, it, it creates a common echelon or, 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 or a group of people who are suffering from the same condition. So it affects an entire group that fits into that legal category whereby they cannot be given citizenship or they're stripped of their citizenship or they cannot be registered under nationality laws. So when they move, uh, first internally and transborder, um, the receiving countries, there are two options for that, and I believe the European experience, for the most part, has been individual reception, because this is how European refugee and asylum system works. It's a legalized system, and there's a determination process, and individuals are <clears throat> examined concerning the veracity of their claims one by one. But in North America, and in many of the countries in the global south, you don't necessarily have an individual determination system for this kind of forced migration flow. Why? Because one million arrive at your border within 24 hours. So you're not going to go through the individual determination because it's quite obvious what has happened across the border. There's internal war, there's civil war, um, there's ethnic cleansing, genocidal <clears throat> events happening. And, and, and those who run out, and I'm not going to have time today, but I, but I hope finally the, 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 the book on Middle Eastern minorities and statelessness comes out, and you will see ample examples as to how certain groups are marked um, uh, as candidates for rend being rendered stateless. And immediately they're expelled, and then they're basically grouped at border areas. And so if you are the recipient state, um, you already know that there's no right of return for them. So the option for you is either to accept them en masse and come up with an in-between category that gives them residency, um, um, labor rights of some sort, and maybe a sliding scheme towards naturalization. That's a political decision you make as a receiving country, and or you try to dissipate that mass. So what I'm saying is in the global south, by and large, the experience of um, other societies facing the stateless of um, <clears throat> um, uh, belligerent states is not an individual experience. It happens in, in large groups. Um, and uh, I mean, there are all kinds of questions concerning what kind of social and political transformations and mass acceptance of other people's stateless people uh, in, would induce in your own polity. So for instance, we know from the Lebanese case that uh, although the Lebanese society uh, de facto accepted a very large number of Syrian and prior to that Iraqi uh, populations, um, and incidentally all of these populations um, by and large happen to be Sunni uh, Muslims as opposed to Shiite Muslims, um, they are very reticent in the changing in changing their status uh, from stateless Syrians or stateless Iraqis, um, because these people have been denied citizenship rights both in Iraq and in current day Syria. Um, but they provide um, a transitional status. Why? Because Lebanon is a constitutional democracy or, 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 or something akin to that. Um, and, and it's very important for them to keep their demographic balance. So, so you, they have a Shiite population, they have a Sunni population, and they have a Lebanese Christian population. And, and their political system is built upon those three groups being balanced in a certain way. If they were to accept two million Sunni Muslims, it's going to entirely change their system of governance. And it's going to change their parliamentary makeup. And therefore, 
although in practice they house the status of the Middle East from Syria and Iraq, they are very reticent in terms of removing that status of statelessness and uh, <clears throat> granting citizenship to these populations. So sometimes one has to really pay attention to what's happening in these en masse situations. Um, so going back to where I started, statelessness needs to be approached from intersectional and interdisciplinary. And uh, <clears throat> we do know for a fact that the, the, the actual experiences of statelessness goes well beyond the scope of the legal definition of statelessness as a, as a personal affair, um, which is one who is not considered an, a national by any state under the operation of its laws. I mean, it's a very kind of um, bare bones definition. Um, it reflects the, the legal reality, but, but when we look at it, we know that it's a very fluid situation, very layered situation, and the remedial measures for that uh, is not simply, all right, then give them citizenship elsewhere, or negotiate with the state to take them back as citizens. Um, there's a reason why they've been expelled in the first place, and unless you undo the circumstances that led to that expulsion, uh, first of all, it's um, <clears throat> irrational and also very dangerous to expect these people to go back, even if they are given citizenship again. Um, but secondly, for the most part, um, surrounding states or hosting states um, may be inclined to give citizenship on an individual basis, but as uh, I indicated in the Lebanese example, it's very difficult for a neighboring state or a receiving state to give citizenship en masse without affecting their own uh, political and demographic makeup. So <clears throat> in many cases, um, we do know that the production of statelessness um, is a, is a, a stage-wise process in the sense that, I mean, early warning <clears throat> signs, so to speak, are always there. You see uh, um, systemic violations of human rights, denial of public service, then you see changes in the in the parliamentary structure, which then leads to the stripping of citizenship of certain groups. Um, and <clears throat> there are obviously certain stateless populations uh, which also become stateless um, as a result of a particular partition um, or as a result of changing of borders. Uh, and then there are many examples of these in Eastern Europe and, and, and former Soviet Russia. But that doesn't mean those uh, immediate uh, rendering of statelessness uh, is easily resolved and or um, it didn't lead to um, subsequent human rights violations. So there's always a human rights dimension when you are rendered or become stateless or, or have been stateless since the birth of a child. Let's say there are certain indigenous populations in South America um, who have been stateless for generations in the sense that the hosting state have never <clears throat> um, accrued citizenship to them and they've never been registered. And then therefore, when there's a dispute about their land, as it happens with extractive industries claims, um, the state, uh, and we know that in, in Ecuador, we know that in Colombia, uh, we know that in Venezuela, um, the, the, the knee-jerk reaction of the state is, well, they're not our citizens, they can go. So <clears throat> it's a very, very interesting uh, position because historically these people own those lands and they have been there for generations, but they haven't been included in the national registry as a strategic move uh, for them to be ex excluded from the political community who make decisions about the use of their land. So statelessness is also a very strategic act uh, as far as the, the states and the societies are concerned who engage in the de declaration of certain groups as not their citizens, although they have been historically there. A similar situation um, <clears throat> might be observed in the Kurdish problem in the Middle East, uh, whether they are part of Iraq as Kurds, part of Turkey as Kurds, um, uh, part of Iran as Kurds, um, whether they have rights um, for uh, autonomous self-governance, um, and at the moment they choose for those rights, um, most of the states in the Middle East uh, opt for denying citizenship to Kurds. So it's almost like you have to make a choice uh, between civil war 
um, and or um, <clears throat> denying your own ethno-religious identity just so that you can remain as a citizen of a given state. So in terms of how do we deal with cases of statelessness, thus far I've touched upon very briefly um, on the topic of defining statelessness, right? So legally, how do we define it um, <clears throat> at the international platform, how it is approached, uh, what happens when you become yet another subject of forced migration when you're stateless? These are all definitional issues. And when you look at the literature, and this is what I've seen the last two, three years, uh, most of the work uh, concentrates on definitions of statelessness. How do you define it? How do you break the definition down? But there's very little done in terms of work on observing the, the, the state of living statelessness. So, so how do stateless people actually exist? How do they live in that state um, right now <clears throat> in hundreds of thousands? We're talking about very large populations across the globe in that situation of statelessness, um, which for most of us uh, is very difficult to uh, grasp because even with uh, refugees and asylum seekers and forced migration, it's a trajectory. We seek an end point whereby there's a journey, ho however treacherous it is, then there's going to be an arrival, there's going to be some sort of assessment and some sort of inclusion, good or bad, but nonetheless there's an end point. With the issue of statelessness, the end point is evasive. And in the Arendtian and Arendtian language, it is as if they don't exist. They are invisible subjects of international law as well as domestic law. So, <clears throat> and then there's the whole issue of theorizing statelessness above and beyond the legal debates. Um, and another aspect of living statelessness is that, let's say nominally you end statelessness. So let's say the, the acquisition of citizenship is possible for a certain group, but that does not necessarily terminate historical lines of discrimination that many stateless groups and especially historically marginalized minorities suffer and continue to suffer. So basically what you create is a, a class of uh, <clears throat> second degree citizens who everybody knows, or at least that's the societal understanding, were once stateless and it's almost like an act of charity that they belong now and they're given legal status, but it takes two to three generations and sometimes more uh, for these people to be accepted as bona fide members of the society. So the legal status in that sense is only one step in the long journey towards a full appreciation of the humanity of the people um, and their rights as 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 legal subjects, as well as 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 uh, you know, a full-bodied humans, and not as some sort of a, a residue um, <clears throat> of, of of the human society. Um, another really troubling aspect of living statelessness, looking at living statelessness, is the distinction we make between um, <clears throat> statelessness in a migratory context where everybody is on the move, and statelessness in situ. And that's a legal term for those of you who are familiar with it. Uh, when you're stateless in situ, um, then, as I said before, the understanding is that it's the problem of that country um, and, and therefore international attention um, and or um, sort of hearing their outcry as to what's happening to them uh, primarily is non-existent. Whereas when statelessness uh, falls under the purview of a migratory context, transporter movement, then it becomes a problem for everybody. And, and there is a more of an urge to formulate policies and, and, and to pay attention to that context. But often at that point, when statelessness uh, flows over the border, it is at the point of no return. So what I'm trying to suggest is sometimes it's really essential, also looking at diaspora moments, what I mean is, let's say you've got a particular minority in a country and over the time span of 30 years, you've got increasing waves of that members of that minority community um, being self-exiled uh, or being exiled. And, and to the point that now the population of the diaspora is larger than the population in the home country. That's already a warning sign that statelessness is about to come. It's around the corner. It only takes one civil war and, and one political turmoil, and you're going to see 
the rest of that minority basically being cleansed. So, and by that time, they might all be stateless and they might receive the attention of the international community, but it's too late. The deed is already done. So <clears throat> in, in that sense, one has to really read de jour, which is in writing legal status of statelessness and the fact of statelessness together. And, and these are the people who are in the risk at the risk of being rendered stateless um, and pay more attention to an effective understanding of citizenship in different constituencies. So I want to give an example, uh, and I know <clears throat> there are very esteemed scholars among our, uh, us uh, who deal with uh, uh, children's rights um, in the international migration context. So if we were to compare um, a child's right to education, um, especially migrant child's right to education, or an asylum seeker a community and then their children's right to education while they're waiting for the decision, it's not simply enough that a child is included within the education system. It's the quality of their inclusion, right? So if they're not speaking the, the, the language, um, or, or if they have been traumatized by war, or um, if the family does not have regular residence, surely you can register them in the school system. But if you're not giving them the support and the backing that they need to succeed in that system, likely they're going to fall out and that will determine the fate of that generation. So uh, effective citizenship is something uh, similar to that. If you're a de facto stateless person, you might have citizenship, but in effect, you're not enjoying any of the rights, you're not <clears throat> uh, enjoying any of the uh, protections, and effective um, de facto statelessness, um, by and large, always leads to de jure, uh, internationally observable stateless but statelessness in the long run. And the second thing I've been uh, repeating myself about is these are not individuals, these are groups. Um, it's almost like knowing your coordinates on a map. If you look at <clears throat> just a point in the sea, you're lost. But if you actually know the qualifications of that group, are there a religious minority? Is there a racialized component to that? Are there historical histories of historical injustice affecting that community? Are there claims about their land? Um, are there neighboring states where they're pushed towards? Are there political calculations made upon their statelessness or change of citizenship thereabout? Uh, who are the guarantors of rights and who are the ones who are withdrawing these rights? All of these have to be taken into account in terms of understanding the lived experience of statelessness uh, in conjunction with the legal definition of statelessness. So what I'm trying to say is, contextualize, contextualize, we must contextualize. Otherwise, it's just going to be a bunch of numbers, um, <clears throat> a headcount of some kind, with no distinct features when we are looking at stateless populations. Um, so I'm wondering, should I stop for a moment and, then, and receive some questions? I know I meant to talk about like a, an hour and then receive questions, but I'm kind of wondering, Maybe, maybe it might be helpful if I just stop for now, if I go on forever. I can't see the chat function here. It's not like Zoom, so I'm not quite sure. No, anybody uh, has... people, uh, so it works this way that uh, uh, people who need to raise their hand, they can do it and then unmute the mic and then they will tell the question. But some people can see the chat, not all of them, unfortunately. So okay. Teams is not so sophisticated as Zoom, and we don't have access to Zoom. That's all right. That's all right. So, so <clears throat> shall I continue? Um, are there yeah. any questions? Maybe I, I would say for like 15 minutes, and then we will start with the questions, because it's technically easier not to divide it into two parts. Now I understand. OK, OK. okay. Um, so then let's give some more examples. So this is actually brought home um, <clears throat> a bit more clearly. So imagine a case where you have an indigenous group um, and they have been um, rendered stateless. How would they be rendered stateless? They haven't been included in the National Register for generations. Um, they are sitting on a land mass which um, <clears throat> the hosting state later on uh, realizes is very valuable in terms of extractive industries. And um, um, there is a confrontation between transnational companies and the government 
of that state and the indigenous group uh, who is on paper stateless. I mean, they are part of that constituency. They are in that border. So, I mean, the fact that they're there, but in terms of um, having the, the, the rights and, and the, the, the papers, um, they don't have it. So there has been instances where, whereby such indigenous groups actually contest acquiring citizenship of that very state where they live as a protest against the colonization of their territory. And, and that's a contestation because what they're saying is you're basically buying us out by uh, supposedly giving us a right that's already ours, which is the citizenship status, in exchange of which you will regally then confiscate our land and remove our, uh, us uh, from our habitual uh, residences. And when such confrontations happens, um, there is a need to re theorize statelessness because one realizes that in the history of that particular nation state, uh, there was already an exclusion at the very beginning of not acknowledging the fact that the indigenous peoples were not part of that political community. They were not recognized as worthy participants of that polity. And they only become a potential legal subject when their land is under scrutiny and in exchange for expropriation rights, um, then citizenship status is extended to them. And so it's not that difficult for them to contest that transaction. They want citizenship to be a relational affair rather than a, a simple transaction. And, and so it would require a different um, <clears throat> path of negotiation with these groups. And so it's kind of difficult sometimes to understand because if you just have a, a, a kind of a blank look at it and then you would say, OK, OK, they were stateless and here they are, they're given citizenship now. So why are they saying no? They're saying no because the cost that citizenship is coming with is so high, they feel that that's not a fair negotiation. And then that's also a contradiction in terms. They already belong to that land, whether that state um, declares them as citizens or not. So so there are some uh, out, seemingly outlying uh, <clears throat> contexts where statelessness becomes a point of contestation. And it, it, it becomes um, an issue concerning um, sharing your story of exclusion with the rest of the polity. Um, there are also other situations such as statelessness in ungoverned spaces. And I mean, that's a very interesting category legally and otherwise. How could there be a space that is ungoverned uh, in, in a globe of 190 states? It's all neatly parcelized and divided, or, or so we think. But what if you have a failed state? What if you have an ongoing civil war that lasts more than 20 years? Um, unfortunately, most of the ungoverned spaces, quote unquote, in legal terminology, currently are within the African context. There are some examples in, in Middle East as well. So in Kenya, for instance, you've got uh, uh, entire groups that uh, <clears throat> habitually live in these ungoverned spaces and they live both in limbo and in insecurity because no state declares them as their citizen and or if you look at uh, occupied territories <clears throat> uh, in the Israel-Palestine conflict um, there's an ongoing concern about who owns that territory um, if it's Israel's territory and therefore Israel will have the legal obligation to take care of them and if it's not Israel's territory, then there isn't a unit that you can actually associate those spaces. And therefore, you cannot uh, issue Palestinian citizenship. And then that creates that continuing situation of limbo and insecurity. In those kinds of examples, you don't have forced migration flows per se, although there will always be a residue of that because it's not um, the, uh, the ultimately the safest way of living. So there'll always be the impetus to leave those ungoverned spaces and the situation of statelessness. Um, but for the most part, these kinds of occasions are historical. So they, they, they have been there for a, a long duration. Um, and the ultimate end result in terms of living statelessness is that these people cannot receive protection. They cannot access social services by the state. And I don't mean welfare, I mean healthcare, education, roads, infrastructure, sewage. Uh, I remember at one time working with a student whose family <clears throat> um, 
were actually from a Palestinian refugee camp in Lebanon. And, and she told me that story. And then later on, we actually found this, the same account uh, <clears throat> um, in the UNRWA archives. So there was uh, um, an infrastructural reform in that particular Lebanese city. And they were building new sewage lines um, to increase the welfare of the, 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 <clears throat> the inhabitants of that city. So the, the municipality, um, so think of it this way, this is the city, and then in there is the, the, the Palestinian refugee camp. And so the municipality will develop the sewage lines all the way to one end of the camp and all the way to the other end of the camp. And then the sewage ended up being dumped into the camp for the whole city because they wouldn't provide the, the sewage facility for the camp itself because these people were not considered as citizens. They were stateless and they still are, by the way, for the most part. So you got very hands on, very immediate results of living in these situations. Uh, another aspect in which I believe <coughs> uh, Elzbieta um, just recently published a, a, a very important book on human trafficking. Uh, stateless people are, are, are very easily targeted by recruitment groups uh, for human trafficking as well as for extremist activities, especially children. Um, so they are much more vulnerable in terms of becoming prey for this international trade um, of humans um, for various uh, insidious ends. So. <clears throat> what can be done, and then that is the T-rising statelessness portion of what I want to talk about, and we have very little time left, and I have uh, so much I'd like to share, so the best way is hopefully when I come to write a working paper. Um, we need to re t rise statelessness, and, and we cannot decouple citizenship status from human rights uh, protection. We've done similar work in 1990s because I used to work with Rainer Bauberg and a number of European scholars in my youth um, about what to do with guest workers in Germany, what to do with, um, um, in general, the European regimes, migration regimes, where naturalization was a no-no. Um, you know, France, Germany, um, <clears throat> Italy, a whole host of countries were very against naturalization policies of people who have been working in their countries for generations. And at that point back in 1990s, um, we were arguing that, well, let's just um, decouple citizenship uh, from human rights protection um, because citizenship cannot be the only uh, harbinger for um, giving work rights, for um, providing national safety um, as a legal subject who is residing within those borders, you should you should be accessing whatever is the constitutional right of citizens. Um, maybe you don't apply for welfare, but then maybe you should if you're working and paying taxes. Um, maybe you have a, a five year renewal of your residence permit, but that doesn't mean you cannot access education and healthcare services because uh, for, for all intensive purposes, you are a contributing member of that society. So I'm going back to that mindset again concerning statelessness because I don't see um, the the UNHCR kind of uh, you know <clears throat> ending statelessness um, uh, announcement to be truthful. It could be uh, effective with one or two occasions in specific uh, negotiations with countries, but by and large the number is so large, and as I said, this is a dynamic problem. Um, you take care of one part of it, and there's going to be double the problem emerging somewhere else. And therefore, there's got to be a decoupling of citizenship uh, rights uh, status from human rights pr uh, provisions and protection. Um, and, and, and rights protection must precede citizenship status. This seems to be the only way out. Um, that also applies to uh, rights of family and protection of stateless children. This is very, very essential because otherwise um, that leads to multi-generational trauma and <clears throat> that leads to a point of no return in terms of literally creating a floating population of uh, invisible peoples um, <clears throat> who do not have citizenship and or nationality. And the second proposition that I make in my work is that citizenship has to be decoupled from nationality. And, and, and you might say, I don't know how it works in Poland, but probably it doesn't. Citizenship and nationality are coupled together 
you are Polish if you have Polish citizenship, or at least um, there is a, a kind of intrinsic reading of Polishness. And the suggestion, not me, but many people working in this field, especially um, under um, a, a, a legal aid, is make is that decouple citizenship from nationality. So nationality does not become the precondition for someone having citizenship. That, that means when you have outsiders who are arriving in mass um, and when they have citizenship, maybe there could be a hyphened identity. Um, but there is no expectation that they have uh, sanguine blood lineage to become a citizen. And, and that decoupling is very, very essential for <clears throat> thinking outside of the box. Um, in terms of the dimensions of problem in Europe, um, I mean, <clears throat> there are a number of INGOs and, and um, ombudsman bodies and advocate bodies that work on stateless peoples in Europe. And the number given is uh, I'm rotating around the figure of half a million. And you might think, who are they? Are they here? And, and you might think, oh, are they all Syrians? No, they're not all Syrians. Um, there are Roma. Um, <clears throat> there are Russian minorities in Eastern European states. Um, there are uh, <clears throat> uh, indigenous populations in Scandinavia. Uh, there are, of course, a large number of asylum seekers uh, from North Africa and the Middle East and uh, South Asia, uh, including Afghanistan. Um, they are stateless and they haven't been uh, given refugee status either. So, so I mean, when you're given refugee status, it doesn't mean your statelessness ends. There are two types of asylum seeking application whereby you declare your citizenship and yet the, um, <clears throat> seek asylum. And the, the other category is you cannot declare citizenship of any country and, and you make um, an asylum application. And part of the problem with the second category is, uh, since this is an adjudicated claim and it goes through a legal determination system, when you say you don't belong anywhere in terms of citizenship, the veracity of your claims are doubly, if not more, questioned as to what has happened to you, because there is no a sheet of proof in terms of country protections. You cannot prove where, they, where you come from. You cannot prove who you are, your name, your date of birth. And, and so the legal determination becomes very, very difficult. And therefore, asylum claims coming from a point of statelessness take um, doubly, if not uh, triply longer um, if they ever reach the determination stage. Um, so <clears throat> looking at the European example of half a million, um, I would say that's actually a very modest figure compared to mass deprivation of nationality and targeting of minority communities uh, in the globe. So Rohingya of Myanmar is one, Dominicans of Haiti in origin, um, Muslim and migrant heritage people in Assam, India are just the three most recent examples, and I already mentioned Syrians. There we are talking about millions, literally millions of people declared en masse citizens and many of whom actually endured large-scale atrocities and, and, and mass crimes. So one aspect of statelessness that's very uh, important for me is that since no state um, <clears throat> lays a claim on you, uh, what, me, that, what that amounts to is when there is mass atrocity, there is no accountability uh, for state criminality either. Because if you were a member of that state and that polity, you can ask for accountability, maybe not today, but later on. Think of Argentina or Chile or an Eastern European examples. You may not be able to ask questions now, but as long as you remain as a citizen, uh, within generations there will come a point where the tide will turn and then you can ask questions about these mass crimes committed by the state and their officers. When you are not a citizen, when you're stateless, there's no point in time that you can turn around unless you're using crimes against humanity legislation, which has very limited scope, that you can ask for accountability. So mass disfranchisement, uh, large scale atrocity, a genocidal cleansing, all of these, when they affect stateless communities, basically go without recognition, other than some of the stories coming out of the diaspora. Um, and uh, and therefore, it's a very problem laden status, as far as I'm concerned, from the uh, perspective of international criminal law. 
And then that's something um, I can talk about at another time because it has its own inner dynamic as to how you deal with it, what are the potential remedies for it, what is the current situation, legally speaking, about these people's claims who are survivors, what happens to their testimonies, what happens to um, their legal standing as stateless people making a claim against a state uh, which exhibited criminal activity against its own people. That's an entirely different ball game. But I think in so many ways, it brings home the urgency of dealing with statelessness as a category in uh, forced migration studies. Um, and it also allows us to pay attention to groups as opposed to individuals and to the larger social political background that creates these populations again and again. So statelessness is not just a matter of not being able to access rights and services. It's not just simply being denied of um, <clears throat> having access to opportunities for a good life and a decent life and unfulfilled human potential um, and a sense of never quite belonging. Um, it's those things, but it's not just those things. It also brings hardship and anguish to entire communities and it creates a history of um, lack of accountability in terms of um, <clears throat> people's um, life stories and what has happened to them as communities. So our failure to put in an effective system to identify statelessness and to grant them protection um, within the human rights or rights protection Aegis leaves not just thousands but hundreds of thousands continually exposed, exposed to repeated and prolonged um, life circumstances of some sort of a detention. It's not detention maybe behind bars or, or you know, in a, in a specific kind of jail system, but it's actually detention of keeping these people away from life and away from histories of nationhood and literally rendering them invisible. And in the in the in the in the in the story of humanity um, throughout 20th century and now in the 21st century. Um, so I want to end with um, <clears throat> suggesting a few places, especially for our Polish partners um, or or audience uh, who are present today. Look around uh, in your own constituency. Look at your national history, and look at groups that are there but they're not there, that you know that are there but but never treated as, as if they're a party to this conversation. So, I mean, Roma is the standard example, but I'm sure there are other examples um, <clears throat> of people of Baltic origin, um, Russian origin, ethnic Russian origin, uh, people who are arriving as asylum seekers. And, um, <clears throat> and, and think about what kind of history you associate with these people. So let's say the Roma, um, or let's say um, particular ethnic minorities in the Polish context, ethno-religious minorities. Um, think of in terms of, is there a history of discrimination about these people? Would you see one of them as prime minister one day? Would they become a minister of education? Could they actually be your classmate? Could they um, access the, the, the kind of services or, or status that, that you have? Um, if they have a status of statelessness, that's the first question. But even if they were given citizenship, and let's say you're dealing with second and third generation, um, did, did the state of statelessness strip these people of a certain kind of visibility in political and social sense? Are they constantly pushed to the margins of the society? Or are they now blending into um, the, the larger system? Uh, how are they recognized? Is there any recognition for their particular history or legal status? And instrumentalizing nationality and treating it as a privilege or using nationality and uh, uh, citizenship um, and, and the stripping of it as a tool for punishment um, speaks a lot for our national histories. And the more we normalize these, the more we'll deal with growing numbers of stateless people, no matter how many human rights defenders are out there, no matter how many people write books, and no matter how, ma how many UNHCR um, initiatives are stated in terms of underlining international obligations of states. So I think I should end here because it's nine o'clock.
my time and I don't know what time it is there, um, but it's been an hour and I don't want to tire people too much. Thank you so much. Uh, there were so many interesting, stimulating points, but it's really for me even uh, hard to imagine uh, like how many questions could be asked just for clarification and so on. But uh, I list. <laughs> So I would like to give the floor first to the other participants and ask them to, yes, to ask the questions. So please either send me, raise the hand. I hope it works. Follow the system. <laughs> and all. Okay. So, so the first one is Elżbieta Gozdziak. Okay. Hello, Negris. Finally, <laughs> yes. see each other not on Facebook. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Hopefully, next time we will have coffee in Poznan. <clears throat> I'm wondering. It was marvelous as always. And you think you are always <clears throat> share. <clears throat> but I'm wondering. I don't do. Uh, I don't work on statelessness myself that much, except that when I was doing research in Malaysia, uh, the Indonesian workers. Um, you know, were in a predicament where if children were born on far, you know, away plantations, um, that, uh, well, they, they didn't register the kid's birth with Indonesian authorities because it was too far. And there was nothing that the Indonesian government would do that was proactive. And that you know, sort of outreach and, and that sort of thing. But th that that thing makes me wonder whether there is a gendered, and, you know, you mentioned age dimension, but I wonder if you could say something about, you know, are women more vulnerable to being stateless or men or how the power dynamic between the two genders works within that kind of a context? I mean, this is a, this is a very important question, and um, <clears throat> recently I, I took part um, on putting together a volume on uh, gendered aspects of uh, forced migration and lived experience of forced migration in the <clears throat> the uh, South Southeast Asian context. And um, I learned a lot from reading the contributing chapters before I was actually writing my my own which was uh, uh, trying to use the term household. Um, again, it, I, I think our unit of analysis has to change. If it's the individual, we almost entirely lose the gender dimension as well as the children specific dimension. But if you use it as a household, household first of all has to be multi-generational. Um, and, and therefore often what you see in a forced migration context is the male head is missing. So these are female headed households along with children, which then render obviously the woman very vulnerable um, for um, gender specific violence and, you know, rape and, and, and trafficking of young girls. Um, but there's also the, 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 the multi-generational dimension of it in stateless populations, because the living conditions are so harsh, um, the older generation is often lost. They're, they're lost in the journey or they're left behind. So th there is a dimension of the children not knowing their identity because identity is a multi-generational affair. You don't earn, learn your identity just from their mommy and daddy, but, but you learn it from the larger community and your immediate next of kin, which is the, 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 the generation before. Um, so when you're not <clears throat> received by the community, I mean, in, in, your, in, in the case, um, you gave Indonesian children born in Malaysia. So they are not considered part of the Malaysian polity. Um, they are often living with their mothers alone. Uh, and therefore there's a, a built in vulnerability to their situation. And they do, they're not exposed to multi-generational identity enforcement. So they have no access to the grandparents. That's what I mean by we're creating these categories of invisible people not just legally, but it's a social debt. It's a form of social debt. Even if you register these children at some point and they become Malaysian, what's their future? Will they become laborers in the same plantation? 
I mean, what would they become in Malaysia if they stay in Malaysia? And then that's a that's a very difficult question, and that has definitely a gendered aspect because if the unit is primarily female, and that's what happens with statelessness and or um, and mass forced migration, then life chances of not just the female uh, heads of the household, but the children are increasingly diminished because they become very vulnerable and there is no social recognition. I hope that, that this kind of starts a conversation and, and you know, I was hitting my, my head on the wall um, when I was reading chapter after chapter and I knew about this dimension, but I think I was so incensed about the larger framework and then the legal debates and war crimes. For some reason, you know, up until my 50s, I never <clears throat> thought that like um, there has to be like a very distinct emphasis on this. I knew it, but when I was writing, my 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 energy was always kind of geared towards somewhere else, and I feel like, for me at least, it's time to correct that now. Thank you. Okay, so maybe I ask my question sure, <laughs> to, to kind of uh, yeah give space to, for other people to think about their question. So I, you described many mechanisms that produce statelessness, but I was kind of intrigued other any mechanism that would help to end it globally. So I know I'm going from this level of individual and household you're trying to, to pay more attention in the last part of your talk, but I, on this uh, high level of abstraction. Are there any mechanisms or groups apart from scholars and lawyers? Um, and are there any positive stories where, like, let's say the stateless group had enough agency to push for the improvement of their status? Um, which leads me so, to one, one more. Uh, like the autochthonous populations where being stateless actually is also a tool they use to, I guess, improve their status when talking with the government and the, uh, about the protection of their territory. So it, could it be seen this way that it actually allows them to have more voice? Yeah. Um, so, I'm going to start with the second one. <clears throat> the, 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 the second one is definitely the case. It's the instrumentalization of statelessness um, as a political tool. And it can sometimes work. Um, I gave the example of indigenous populations in, in South America. We have some examples in the Middle East, whereby <clears throat> by declaring their history of statelessness, they make a point that they need autonomous governance. It didn't work under the existing system. Um, and we, we see something um, perhaps similar uh, in terms of the resolution, the ultimate resolution of the, the Bosnian problem in former Yugoslavia. Um, so, so there are moments where statelessness can indeed become um, a, 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 an instrumental tool uh, for making a political statement. Um, but I, I think uh, colleagues who work on nationality, citizenship and international relations are, are more at home in terms of understanding how that instrumentalization works in terms of internal obligations. So there's lots of good news and I didn't want to bore people. I mean, this is this is stuff that I love, but <clears throat> not everybody has to. So um, the, obviously there is the 1954 convention. Then there's also the 1961 Convention on Statelessness and Prevention of it thereof. There is a European Convention on Nationality and Convention on Avoidance of Statelessness in relation to state succession. These are all international law tools. And if the state did not accede to uh, any of the core stateless conventions that I just listed, um, they can also <clears throat> somehow uh, accept these instruments without reservation um, or sometimes if they put reservations in their accession they can withdraw them. So effective protection of statelessness uh, means that <clears throat> there are multiple legal frameworks that one can refer to 
And most states at one point or another, unless like India, um, they owe their statehood to partition, uh, in which case they're very, very about signing such conventions, uh, would have signed it and ratified it. And they would have put it at the back burner. And then you might ask, I mean, this is an international law question. Why would they do it? Well, they do it because of legitimacy issues. They are a new member of the UN and they want to show to the international community that they do it by the book. And so for stateless people and advocacy groups, um, in order to identify and protect stateless people, you can actually call your state to task if they signed and ratified one of these conventions that it is their international duty. Um, so national sovereignty is a very interesting thing. It means you're the king of the castle, right? And everybody, all other kings recognize you as king of that castle. But it also means as the king of the castle, you should be protecting your people. That's the condition for uh, having the ownership of that castle. If you mess up with your people, then all the other kings don't have necessarily the reason to recognize you as a, a, a benevolent king. You know, you become a belligerent state. So I know I, I'm giving a very uh, stupid looking example, but that's the nature of it. So effective protection of citizenry um, <clears throat> is actually a part of the deal. You sign these conventions as you, as you declare statehood, and later on your stateless people or neighboring states can call upon that, saying you signed that. It's part of you being a state. It's part of the condition of being the king of the castle. So honor it. You have to honor it, which could lead to prevention and reduction. And um, Isabella uh, rightfully asked about success stories. Some of the success stories that came out of UNHCR's intervention precisely happened on those grounds. The states were uh, called upon the conventions they already signed and their obligations toward their own citizens as well as neighboring countries. Because in international law, interestingly enough, if you create cascades and cascades of very unhappy people pouring out of your borders, you're actually constituting a threat to international safety and security. Because that could provide groundwork for civil war and or regional warfare. So it's quite possible your neighbors may not be so pleased with you about creating these large populations of state people coming to their border. Um, it, it is almost like a, an attack to a human shield. Um, another aspect of access to justice for stateless people, there are a number of effective remedies. Um, and most of these are what we call constitutional remedies. Um, so there are um, uh, principles on deprivation of nationality, uh, as a secure, national security measure, which basically bars individual states using this as a tool en masse to cleanse populations. This is actually a crime um, as far as international criminal law is concerned. And similarly, you have the right to ask and seek for constitutional protections on account of you being um, within the borders of that particular state. And, and we know that from uh, examples in India, which is very um, an odd case, because while India is creating more stateless people um, with reference to Assam, uh, the region of Assam and Muslim Indians, it's also providing remedial measures for Tamils and Rohingyas who are in India under constitutional protection. So sometimes you see both of them happening at the same time in the same breath, which is very, very um, interesting, but that's the way it goes as far as nation states are concerned. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, if you look at the UN Charter uh, on Human Rights, everyone has the right to nationality and no one shall be arbitrarily deprived of this nationality. This is Article 15 of Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and, and so, like, there's a lot of um, the, the in-between lines of the Declaration of Human Rights and other UN documents that declare it outright that it's illegal. Um, the deprivation of nationality, um, other than um, momentous occasions such as partitions or a drawing of new um, national borders, um, is illegal in international law. Does that mean you can't do it? Well, you can do it within your borders and then those people spill over. So de facto, you do it. Um, then what can be done about what you have done as a state and or society. The people who are receiving these stateless uh, groups 
um, <clears throat> who are deprived of their rights um, and, and impaired uh, in terms of civil, cultural, political, economic um, and, and social existence um, and, and suffer from discrimination, reformant, torture, cruel, inhuman, degrading treatment, um, deprivation of liberty and security, denial of access to all uh, public services, denial of private and family life, denial of access to justice, denial of the right to travel to work for effective remedy. What am I giving you the list of? These are the rights violations. So by the, by the very nature of being rendered stateless, you are actually suffering from this long list of rights violations that no state should engage. And that's my little shortcut there, uh, <clears throat> you know, as a, as a, as a legally um, inclined uh, scholar, that there is in fact a, a case you can make in national courts for stateless people who are received by other countries, that the deprivation of nationality they suffered then leads to a cascade of rights denials in the new constituency. Um, another issue is about nationality. So nationality refers to a legal status of an individual in relation to a state, and it embodies a legal bond between the individual and the state, and this is what we need to watch for, for the purposes of international law. So it's not just about the state giving in whimsy citizenship and nationality to you and me, saying, you know, you're good, you can stay with me, but it is a status for the purposes of international law. So what that means is while you were habitually living in that state, that particular state is obligated by that legal bond in the eyes of other state. So when that state cuts that bond and, <clears throat> and renders you stateless, then they are basically uh, annulling a contract that they made with other states. So think of Poland. This is hypothetical, um, uh, sort of a <clears throat> um, catastrophic scenario. Polish state decides that uh, people who have, uh, um, um, let's just go really extreme, um, blue eyes and curly hair can no longer be citizens. So that's going to, you know, call away maybe one third of the Polish uh, population, right? And and then the other two thirds, let's say, agree. So the legislative passes an act, and then um, <clears throat> makes uh, um, certain uh, changes to the constitutional framework, and and bingo, all of a sudden, one third of the Polish Polish population no longer have Polish citizenship, um, with the understanding that. The remaining population decided they no longer fit into Polish nationality criteria. So what you're doing is it looks like an internal affair, but you're actually violating something for the purposes of international law as well. So because what's going to happen to those people who are no longer Polish citizens? If they remain in Poland, they likely won't have access to all the rights. And if they go outside, they're going to become a burden for the outside society. So there's a lot of pressure from outside for states not annulling that contract, that legal bond between people who are residing there in territory. So there will be pressure from Germany and from Poland's neighbors for uh, pulling back that change and, and giving the, the citizenship nationality back to people with blue eyes and curly hair. Not for the sake of humanity only, but because it's gonna be a major problem for the surrounding states. And then that I see is also part of the, the interesting the solution. Deprivation of nationality should be recognized and announced as an illegal act in international law, which should have consequences directly for the states who are engaging in it. Um, and then, um, I mean, there are networks on statelessness. There is one on um, European, um, there's Nansen, the Institute of Statelessness and Inclusion and European Network of Statelessness, and they actually um, <clears throat> um, engage in submissions to the uh, Universal Periodic Review of uh, relevant UN bodies, and they prepare reports on human rights challenges pertaining to statelessness in different European countries, and they keep the issue very alive. What they cannot do in the European context is they cannot attack or question the practices of let's say states in Asia or states in the Middle East who are creating stateless populations 
but they can certainly attack the frameworks and practices within Europe, within European states that create or prolong uh, <clears throat> conditions of statelessness. So often, at least this is my understanding, um, the remedies come, come forward regionally. You're not going to look for like a global body dictating, but that these problems will need to be solved regionally and in hubs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I don't know if it. Uh, yeah, Michal has a question, so please unmute. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you for this wonderful, uh, the rich information lecture. And I, I'm not sure whether I have, you know, managed to 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 gather everything what you have you have said. Uh, and I have some general questions. I can't ask too many, of course, but I have some general questions, and then one more, let's say, particular one. Uh, so I would say that well, your understanding of stateless statelessness is is quite broad because yeah okay so it can be it's not just about the people who are uh, expelled from their uh, from their country and do not have uh, citizenship right of their country of origin yeah and that's definitely for sure that the international system and the nation state system produces uh, uh, such uh, such categories i was just well i know that it is just conceptual why with regard to this why we don't we don't try to say to, to to see it from another point of view well that this statelessness is a natural state <laughs> oh i see i see okay okay and then, so and then it's imposed upon people yeah and the, the citizenship and the duty to belong to any state is is something uh, abnormal it's a new invention. I yeah. like it very much when you put it that way. Actually, <laughs> that's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah, but that that's that's the general, and I know that it's uh, so let's say philosophical or abstract that it doesn't really make uh, sense. But then there is a question of statelessness and non-citizenship and non-citizenship. Does it mean that you don't have a citizenship? You are stateless. And the, when you have citizenship, do you have a state? I can have a Polish citizenship and live in uh, and live in Britain or anywhere, and that means that I am stateless. Right. And the third question, and this is the last question: What about the so-called denizens? Yeah, and the, you mentioned the uh, the Baltic states, actually two Baltic states, which is Latvia and. Estonia, because Lithuania is, is the other, it was the other case. Yeah, that these people were actually those, we, we know the story more or less, yeah, that these uh, who didn't have, who are not of uh, uh, descendants of interwar uh, citizens and of not Estonian or Latvian nationality, they were denied their citizenship, but they still could live in in these countries, yeah, unless they were military and you know functionaries, state uh, Soviet functionaries. So, but they well, they were denied their citizenship, but they were not denied their, the state. I mean, the existence in the state, and they were treated, by the way, the same way as European countries treat immigrants. Yeah, that you can apply for citizenship. So, were they stateless or not? I mean, do you want to continue? No, no. Okay, okay. <laughs> it's enough. <laughs> yeah, well, I think it's enough. It's fascinating conversation, and many of which I don't have answers. Obviously, these are questions that would lead to further questions. Um, I'm going to start backwards. Latvia, Estonia, and Lithuania. So the situation is not about whether they live, whether they've been cleansed, but what happens to them if they decide to own property. What happens to them if they decide to travel outside of the country? So in, in many ways, the portfolio of rights and protections that they have um, are decimated. They're very limited. 
What happens? They decide to travel to Soviet Russia. What happens? They apply for a government position. And in their case, it's a very convoluted issue because this is um, akin to a colonizing minority, right? So they they were sent there, multi-generational existence, and they had some privileges, and then those are taken away. Um, but along with it, the citizenship is taken away as well. So the message on is on the wall saying, either you naturalize uh, or marry a national and perhaps get full citizenship and or you leave. You are in between. You are not considered as full part of the history of this country. And I'm not criticizing that attitude. There might be um, very solid reasons why Estonians or Latvians feel that way towards the Russian minority and their remnants. Um, nonetheless, think of third generation and children who are born into these families. They are not aware of these circumstances. They are no different than babies born into an Estonian family. And yet their life, the course of their life is determined by their, their situationality. And sometimes it's akin to communal punishment. Um, the entire group is, is, is given that treatment. So there are some problematic aspects of that. In terms of, uh, <clears throat> you know, you are Polish and you're living in England, you don't have citizenship, are you stateless? You're not because you have a sta citizenship of one country. You have Polish citizenship. You live in England without citizenship, but you already belong to the Aegis of one state. Statelessness is when no state on earth, literally on this green pastures of ours, um, lays a claim on you. Nobody declares you as part of them. And and I think in, in going back to your first suggestion, maybe it's a state of freedom. Maybe you are free of all these dictatorships and imposing <clears throat> institutions and political power. But at the same time, it ma it makes you invisible as a legal subject if you couple rights and access to constitutional protections with um, <clears throat> having some sort of a status. And, and I am fully agree in agreement with you. I think citizenship and or nationality are artificial. These are human creations and they are, they are um, tools used by political communities. So I feel for myself, I'm going to tell you a story. I live in Canada for a long time and I have two sons who are raised here. Um, when I got cancer diagnosis, which looked pretty dismal in terms of prospects, um, I looked at my family and I thought, OK, it's time to apply for citizenship here because <clears throat> they were all my dependents. And then I was living there on a work visa. I could have applied for citizenship, but because I was traveling so much, I just renewed it. And, you know, it occurred to me it was a need. But then there came a point whereby my boys were at stake. If I died, like they uh, they are dependent to me. And so I started the procedure. And what happened is, uh, first of all, I had to pass a citizenship test. And because I teach constitutional administrative law, I, I passed it with 100, which was very funny because the officer there was like, how did you know all the answers? And I said, <clears throat> I teach this stuff. Um, so it was a lot of fun. But then I was thinking, great, this is done deal. And, and she said, I'm sorry, but your file is on hold and it has to go through judicial review. I said, what? And she says, because you have been traveling to the Middle East so often, uh, under the Harper Conservative government, there's a question mark as to, you know, why did you make all these trips? And I said, do I have the right for you to separate my son's files from mine? Because it's really important that they are treated separately. And the officer said to me, yes, we can do that. But that means they can get their citizenship and you won't. I said, that's all right. Like that's 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 what I what I really want is is for them to be secure here <clears throat> because they have uh, you know British and Middle Eastern citizenship but they don't have Canadian citizenship. So then what happens is um, I am called to court to give an explanation and this is this is a very interesting end um, and I wrote a, a, a ten page explanation as to the human rights work I do and the different countries I work my position in Canada, my advocacy work in the Canadian context, my contributions to Canadian society as well as international society. And I ended up my letter saying that I fully understand if under government regulations, because I am away from Canada for more than 90 days a year, you decide I am not fit for Canadian citizenship, but it will be my loss as well as your loss. 
So then that answer, that that went into a hearing apparently, <clears throat> and the decision arrived to me saying you were granted the right for citizenship. And the citizenship ceremony comes. So we go, and there's a judge. There's a justice of peace, and there's a judge. <clears throat> And then you kind of do your oath and, and, and then he, he shakes your hand. In this case, it was a he. And I noticed the name. It was a Polish name. And so this was a Polish emigre <clears throat> who, who ran away um, at the time when there was the union movement and then there was the whole upheaval and then came to Canada as a refugee. And he kept working for the Polish resistance, so to speak, against the Soviet regime at the time. And so when it was my turn, he, he extends his hand and, and he says to me, I read your story and I saw a lot of me in you and that's why I granted you the right. So I thought, this is what it is. Like it's, it's, a, it's an appropriation, it's a status. It doesn't define who you are. It's a judgment about your situational um, <clears throat> validation. If it wasn't that judge, if it was somebody else, who never had that kind of experience, they would have looked at my letter and they would have said bullshit. Let her just stay as whatever. But because he had an understanding of the fluidity of these situations and multiplicity of belongings and the desire to do something elsewhere, as well as contributing here, he used discretion in terms of giving me the Canadian citizenship I have. So, so I, I think the question that you ask about, you know, what is citizenship and whether it's a right or whether it's an attribution, a validation of some sort, who, 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 who has the authority. Um, that's extremely important. And I hope I get to see you in person and you can ask more questions of this kind, which will make my life very difficult. <laughs> you are all muted. Oh, I can. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you again for answering the questions and first of all for the wonderful presentation speech. And I think it encouraged many people here to maybe read your text and to think about those issues uh, much more than we normally do think about stateless people. Though in case of Roma in Poznan, we actually also had a presentation two months ago about uh, the situation. So thank you again for at this very early time for you to agree to give this talk. And I hope as we sometimes we see in person, I would like to thank all the participants and the people who asked the questions as well. And I hope to see you again during the webinar at the end of February. So have a good day and thank you. Thank you so much. All the best to you and thank you for hosting me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much.